you know, there was a reason why we didn't all just, you know, go off and scatter to the four winds and, you know, join the big studios or games companies or things like that. We wanted to kind of express our own voice. Um, uh, animation as a medium, it's so time consuming. We really wanted to make sure that as storytellers, we had a big hand in the stories we got to tell. Welcome back to Making Imagination, the podcast that looks at animated filmmaking one craft at a time. I'm Wes, your host. Today is a special episode because, well, rather than discussing just one craft in animation, we'll be talking about independent animation. And who better to discuss that with than Nora Toomey, the co-founder of the five-time Oscar-nominated animation studio, Cartoon Saloon. When the studio was founded a little over 20 years ago, the creators were working just to keep the lights on. Now, having garnered numerous nominations and awards, they've earned the respect of the animation industry across the globe. I caught up with Nora Toomey, whose directorial efforts include The Secret of Kells, The Breadwinner, and My Father's Dragon, to learn more about producing animated films independently. What follows are some of her insights into more than 20 years in the business. You know, your early short film from Darkness, uh, it's perhaps not the typical uh, content for animation shorts, uh, and it's kind of rather dark. Uh, so why was this something that you wanted to pursue as an early project in your career? Yeah, I, th- well, I think, um, maybe in Europe, maybe, uh, um, rather than other places like, um, animation, uh, like short film as a medium is, um, a medium with which you can explore, um, anything and everything. I think I've seen, uh, many different types of short films, be they for family audiences or be they experimental or be they kind of music, uh, you know, um, centered. Um, and so it, there's such a there's such a great opportunity to explore ideas without having to commit years and years of your life um, or, you know, um, just to let you go down a road enough to see whether that's where you want to go or just explore, but yeah, basically to explore ideas rather than beginnings, middles and ends. Um, I also love the economy of short films because within the first 30 seconds, you have to grab your audience in some way. You have to um, you have to pique their their interest. You have to set a, a tone. You have to push um, the personality out through the screen and through the speakers and um, and let people know that they're watching something that feels unique or feels it's like it's it, its own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess. That's why I love short films as a, as a medium. I think they're incredibly expressive and actually more free than uh, features have, you know, in terms of what you can achieve or what you can get funded even. Um, why I I made uh, From Darkness, it's based on an Inuit uh, folktale about um, a woman who was cast into the sea by her father and she her her. Uh, body breaks down at the the bottom of the sea, and a, a lonely fisherman kind of catches catches uh, her remains in his in his uh, hook and takes pity on on uh, on her. Um, it was just a lovely story. I think I first came across it in a in a book called uh, Women Who Run with Wolves. And it was a story about uh, it, it was used in the context of that book as a way of um, kind of uh, shining a light on things that you might be fearful of. Um, the idea of transformation, the idea of forgiveness, the idea of looking at things in a, in a different light and how that can transform uh, something. And so philosophically, I was really interested in that whole theme. And so that's it really um, I, I realized that a lot of my sketchbooks were uh were centered on a on um a, a drawing from that story and so that's where that's kind of how I came to think of it as something that might make a good short film um the film board in Ireland screen Ireland uh, were really supportive and it was at a time where cartoon saloon was quite young back at night where we were just we just started so we had we were making commercials we were doing kind of early web animation flash animation we were doing pretty much anything we could do to keep the lights on while also making a kind of proof of concept uh, teaser for The Secret of Kells. So it seemed like um, and the next step, I guess, for us to make a, a short. And so that's 
that's why in terms of tone, I don't know, I'm always kind of, I guess, um, uh, drawn to things that, uh, uh, like, um, you know, serious or, um, you know, subtext. Uh, I'm, I'm never really interested in, um, uh, you know, kind of folly for folly's sake. I think if you can, if you can layer storytelling in a way where certainly you can have fun and you can have lightness, you can have all kinds of joy, but if it's anchored with, um, uh, you know, with, with some of the more kind of complex things in life, I think then that that's what makes a interesting story. Certainly as a storyteller, that's what keeps me interested. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, Secret of Kells uh, as being your first feature uh, and shorts being different from feature films. But I, I suppose probably um, even from animated series, which you guys have done at Cartoon Saloon as well. Um, were there ways in which directing from darkness prepared you to go on to secret of Kells and were there ways in which maybe it couldn't have prepared you for Kells? Yeah, it, it did. Absolutely. And that we had learned uh, in college. So I met, you know, Tom and Paul, my partners in cartoon saloon. I met them in college along with a number of people that we uh, still work with today. Um, and the, um, the curriculum there was kind of built on the Sheridan model in terms of, um, of of classical animation. So it taught us a lot of fantastic life drawing. It taught us about, um, uh, you know, how to animate, how to animate well, how Glenn Keane would animate. In fact, that uh, Glenn came to visit our our, our school um, uh, when, back when I was in college and really, uh, really inspired everyone. Um, so we were very much inspired by Disney um, classics and, you know, primarily, I guess, and our, our whole school was at that time in the mid 90s, uh, very much inspired by that. And uh, Don Bluth was, you know, had a studio in Dublin and he was doing, you know, and again, very classical, um, you know, uh, slow in, slow outs, arcs, you know, all, all of the, the kind of things that you you uh, come to expect from that wonderful kind of cushioned, um, you know, theatrical expression of Disney animation. Um, and when we set up ourselves in Cartoon Saloon, we were striving to find our own identity um, rather than, you know, there was a reason why we didn't all just, you know, go off and scatter to the four winds and, you know, join the big studios or games companies or things like that. We wanted to kind of express our own voice. Um, uh, animation as a medium, it's so time consuming. We really wanted to make sure that as storytellers, we had a big hand in the stories we got to tell. Mm -hmm. I always felt that there was no point in doing like your best animation if you didn't believe in the story that you were telling. Um, and so that's why we figured that if we had, if we could learn <laughs> how to tell stories, because we weren't taught that much about um, how to, you know, the, the the business of storytelling, you know, um, that, that or storyboarding even or things like that. So um, the shorts really helped me, um, you know, you know, build everything from storyboards and the departments that you need. You need a layout department, you need a background department, you need a rough animation, clean animation uh, department uh, all the way through comp scheduling budgeting all of that kind of stuff um uh, we did it all I mean we were only a handful of people at that point so you had to do uh, a little bit of everything um and that was a fantastic education and you kind of you know lived or, or, or died by that because if you overspent in one department you literally didn't have it in the other huh. um so it it taught uh, us all because it wasn't you know on the short everybody worked on that short uh Tom did you know Paul um Barry Reynolds um uh, Jeremy Purcell we all worked on it um and then uh it, so it 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 taught me I suppose a, uh, a fair amount but then yeah I mean that the scale of a feature film is just huge and given that there was a lot of stuff that we didn't understand we didn't um we didn't have a, a head of finance in our company you know at, at the time we didn't have a you know that it, it was it was a while before we got a, a line producer on um and so just the, the 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 scale of the problems that you encounter on a feature mm. are just uh, huge. And we had youthful enthusiasm, of course, and we had um, elbow grease. You know, we were <laughs> at the time we were, you know, um, staying late uh, to finish storyboards so that they'd be ready for a layout department that was starting up. And we had brilliant, we had very experienced co-producers, Didier Brunet um, from Les Amateurs at the time, who's uh, uh, now in Falavari. Uh, he was our co-producer and had, you know, was an extremely uh, experienced producer at the time. So we did have uh, access to a lot of knowledge, but we were making it on paper as well, which was, you know, an added complication. It was a co-production. So it wasn't even that we could have everybody in house. We knew that we had to co-produce. 
Hmm. our film, which meant that we were shipping boxes of paper uh, to different countries, making, um, you know, exposure oh, wow. sheets. Yeah, you know, and trying oh, to break down phonetically the, you know, the dialogue for uh, exposure sheets for animators, trying to take into consideration that we were ascending from Ireland to um, France, where, you know, Belgium, where um, the phonetics are different, you know? Oh, my Even goodness. So, so it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a baptism of fire for sure. <laughs> Um, but yeah, um, having said all of that, and it's kind of making me tired, even thinking about all of, you know, or remembering some of the problems that we had, I would prefer to, um, you know, do that kind of work, make those kind of mistakes, learn that way, than you know, what might've been, um, an easier path, but, you know, by, you know, entering it, but maybe a, a, like a, a studio where I mightn't have had that much say on, on the stories I got to work on. Yeah. Okay. Do you think that, I mean, that sounds like a baptism by fire. Um, Do you think that, you know, and because you had to kind of sort of get this going and figure everything out yourselves, do you think it was a a big loss or um, in some ways an advantage that uh, Don Bluth studio had gone away uh, just a few years before you guys got started was, did that leave a hole? Is that, or. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, I suppose nothing is ever, that bad you know it was because yes it was it was initially for the Irish industry uh it was it was massive to lose uh Bluth Studios um out of Dublin but from that so many small studios started so you know you um you know whether there was people who had worked in Bluth Studios or people like me who had expected to maybe get employment there that didn't you know kind of thing and that, that uh, went on to set up our own studio so there's a number of small studios it was also around that time where it became um, like even in terms of um, the kind of technical capabilities of studios, smaller studios, you know, um, having computers that you can run after effects on and things like that, that started, you know, that we're talking about the late nineties, early two thousands. So those kind of opportunities had just become available to us where we could make a short film with not a huge amount of money, or we could uh, plan our feature and, you know, um, you know, get enough uh, computers to uh, be able to process and, you know, scan the uh, the drawings that we were doing or work with partners that could do that, uh, as we did with our Belgian partners uh, on The Secret of Kells. So um, it was certainly an opportunity. I don't think we would have seen it or anybody in Ireland would have seen it as an opportunity at the time, but it did turn out to be. And I think, you know, the industry now. Um, you know, there's the population of Ireland is something like 5 million. We have about uh, 1,500 to 2,000 people working full time in animation in wow. the country. It's, you know, it, it, it's a lot. It's certainly on par with the live action film industry here, which gets a lot of work. Um, uh, so it's uh, it's very, very strong. We are in a unique position because we're English speaking, but we're also on the edge of Europe. Uh, we have access to some kind of soft financing models. We have a great tax break here in Ireland that um, makes it very attractive for um, producers to co-produce with us. Uh, and so we really do have a, a unique um, set of circumstances. Even in Kilkenny, I mean, there was no animation industry, of course, in Kilkenny. The, the town where Cartoon Saloon is, uh, I think there's something like 30,000 people uh, in the city of Kilkenny. We have two animation studios in Kilkenny. There's a uh, oh. cartoon balloon. There's Lighthouse Studios, which is set up, um, I think, over five years ago now by um, uh, uh, Clint Eland of uh, Mercury Filmworks, and it's run by Claire Finn, who's an uh, incredible person. Um, and uh, you know, they they have a lot of work going on. They were recently worked on uh, uh, the Cuphead show, Bob's Burgers, you know, uh, feature. Oh, wow. So they're just uh, incredible. So there's a massive community in Kilkenny that wasn't there before. Um, so yeah, sometimes what you think is bad luck is actually great luck. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, you talked about trying to want you to find your own voice and telling the kind of stories that you guys want to tell. And some of that, I think quite obviously has been the aesthetic that you guys have chosen. Um, but some of it is also in the stories that you've chosen to tell. For instance, Secret of Kells is in my opinion, a, and a, a bold first film. Um, but then even your second feature film, um, the breadwinner, I think is another bold choice. <laughs> Um, is, can you talk about just what kind of goes into when you, um, decide you want to tell a story? Uh, is it, um, 
is it just something that strikes you or, or, or is there any sort of active sort of working against what everyone else is doing? Like what, what tends to draw you to a story and, and seem like it's going to be worthwhile to, to really kind of work on for a number of years and then talk about for a number of years after. Yeah. And I, I suppose it's interesting because we're different at different times of our life. So the secret of Kells was first conceived by uh, Tom Moore and Aidan Hart when they were in school, <laughs> in uh, when they were like teenagers, uh, when they were in school together. That's where that, that uh, kind of came from. And, and originally it was a kind of more adult focused uh, film, really kind of a film about two monks and their kind of philosophical discussions as they faced the onslaught of a Viking invasion. Invasion. It was, um, and, and it morphed as as uh, as you know, Aiden and, and Tom morphed, and then as I joined and Paul joined, and we all um, started to kind of input, um, and then we had a like great screenwriter Fabrice who came on um, once we um, started to to get the money together to to make the Secret of Kells. So it. Um, it became the story that we were most interested in telling at the time. It really is a story about, it's about, you know, finding hope in the face of, you know, um, uncertainty, you know, when chaos enters your life, what, what is it that you can, what, what is it that you hold sacred? What is it that you can hold on to? Um, these were things that were really interesting to us as storytellers and certainly to Tom, um, you know, at, at the time when we were making The Secret of Kells, we all, because we're, you know, it's a studio that we set up because we're a group of friends who like to make stuff together and not because we were a group of business people who really wanted to run a, you know, a huge studio. Um, finding the stories that can um, make us really passionate and make our teams really passionate and sustain that passion for those number of years is the most important thing uh, to us. We'll never be Pixar or Disney or, you know, uh, we, we don't uh, we don't want to be. We we want to have our own voice. We want to tell stories, um, the stories that we can tell. Uh, again, I, I'm drawn again to kind of speak about the unique kind of um, position that we're in, you know, with, with the breadwinner we co-produced with um, uh, aircraft pictures in Canada um, and uh, with uh, our, our partners in Luxembourg, Studio 352. Uh, you'll always find other studios who have um, skills that are um, compatible with your own uh, and that are also passionate about telling stories that might not otherwise get told. And I think that's what um, um, I think that's what kind of motivates us the most in, uh, telling stories that are worth telling that that are not going to make huge sense for a huge studio or something like that. Just, um, you know, because there was, there was a time even with Wolfwalkers where, you know, telling a particular story about um, a, a, a town, you know, um, that, that, uh, it did, you know, it didn't make as much sense as, as it does now in retrospect, you know, it, it would not have, uh, it, it would have looked a little darker maybe than, than, than what we had done um, with Song of the Sea. Um, so yeah, that, that's, I think that's what, what motivates us most. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and again, you really do have to live with these projects for a long time. Um, so I think, you know, when you find something you're really passionate about in the beginning, I think that's telling for whether or not you can <laughs> um, carry on in the future. Uh, for your film, The Breadwinner, uh, there's a scene um, where Pravana gets a, a haircut. And I remember, um, I think from a podcast interview you had done uh, previously, you had talked about maybe there was going to be some uh, some dialogue there that you eventually cut and made it a much more silent um, scene. Um, but in watching this scene, it is very subtle acting. Uh, and yet the shapes and the designs are very minimal uh, and and even, um, even simplistic. Uh, which I recall, you know, in studying the Prince of Egypt, they talked about how difficult it was to animate subtlety in animation. Uh, and their designs are much more complex and much more, um, yeah, just uh, in that way. It's a risky move to... to to move in that direction, to, to sort of do something really subtle, um, with more minimal designs. Uh, do you, have you found, uh, strengths, uh, in the way that you guys design your films and, and, and series, um, or have there been limitations? Um, how has that been as you approach those kinds of challenges with the various aesthetics you guys have chosen? 
Yeah, I guess we find strength in the limitations. I love the idea that you can evoke or, yeah, uh, um, an emotional response from an audience using as few lines as possible and by, you know, um, uh, pulling back with the emotion and letting your audience come towards the screen uh, that, that bit more. And, you know, oftentimes if you go the other way and you try and do too much, um, audiences are so sophisticated you know even children are you know that that they they'll feel it they'll feel that you're trying to manipulate them and they'll they'll pull away so letting them fill in the gaps um uh, is a is a really powerful uh tool uh on all of the films and the series um we do try to make a virtue of the economies that we need in order to you know get the get the project on on uh, on time and on schedule so we don't just reach for the stars and anything goes and it's you know the more is more and you know better is better uh we, we we try to look at how what the story needs in terms of its design so what kind of a story is it how does the design run along the 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 narrative arc of the characters what how how does the, the design feed into what the characters need in order for us to be able to tell the story as well as we possibly can and that oftentimes brings economies it brings some you know um, a, a structure to it so you know that um say with um with uh, the breadwinner where we had a, a limited uh, budget and because the character of Parvana wasn't somebody who was going to be hugely vocal in her expression of the things that she wanted or demanded we knew that she was somebody who was really sophisticated uh, in terms of how she communicated even with the people in her own uh, in her own family and with her audience you know um, that we could say a lot with just a, a glance, you know, that we could that we could just let her her gaze drop for a, a, an instant, or her, um, you know, see her sister coming into that little small enclosed space with her, and uh, let that be much more powerful. Let the composers Jeff and Michael Dana take over there, and let it be much more powerful than, um, you know, whatever wonderful lines of dialogue we had. Um, Anita Doran, our screenwriter for uh, The Breadwinner, and we had uh, actually the first draft of the, the screenplay was written by Deborah Ellis, the, 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 um, the writer of the, the book, the novelist, um, on which the, the, the film was based. Um, they'd done a, a, a really such a gorgeously poetic, beautiful job with the screenplay, but the process of animation and the process of storyboarding is always taking away. You know, you take away everything that's superfluous and you're left with the strength then. And the strength oftentimes is in the moments that are silent or the, you know, uh, the, the, the moments where you can hear a character's breath. Um, and then that really also the contrast of that with the kind of larger moments in the film, usually around the climax of the film, um, that, that, that kind of contrast is something that you're building all the way along and every department is aware of it from, hmm. from your screenwriter to your storyboarders, your animators, your uh, background artists who, who make the, like the color script, your art director who makes the color script, managing the emotional journey of the color palette of the film hmm. and your, your sound designer, your composers, everyone um, has to be aware of what it is that the characters need in every scene along that arc in order to tell the best story they can. Wow. Yeah. No, that's interesting. That makes sense. Um, that makes sense. Uh, and I think it comes through um, in the films that you've worked on. Uh, you did talk a little bit about uh, short films versus kind of uh, a little bit feature films. Um, but as a studio, you guys also do um, animated television, which yeah. is yet another sort of um, chunk of time. Mm -hmm. um, Art, do you find that there are uh, advantages to that medium Um or disadvantages as compared to doing a short film and a feature film? Um, we love the medium of, of series. Or, uh, uh, it, it's fantastic. It's so time consuming. <laughs> it's even more so <laughs> than, than feature films you're talking about, you know, hours and hours of, of, uh, of content and the planning that goes into that is, is huge. Um, partnering on, on series, finding exactly the right partner so is that, the um, original idea um, and the original pitch of the of a series bears some relation to what you mm. end up with. That's a huge thing because oftentimes, like you are talking about, you know, bringing on, you know, uh, studios or distributors or broadcasters who have a slot for you. So much more than in um, in feature films, where really 
at the end of the day, there's, um, you know, nobody knows anything, as, as William Goldman says, uh, you know, it, it, with with features, everybody does think they know exactly what it is that's going to be a hit and 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 how how to build that. And so it's it's difficult to try and maintain your identity mm-hmm. with um, with series work. Uh, we 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 do it. We need it uh, in terms of you know even just keeping our our studio going. We need to have the two streams of uh, of things going on at all times, the features and the and the series. But the series are are challenging. Um, but they're and uh, oftentimes we have two different teams. You know we have some crossover between uh, animators or art directors or background artists, but. Um, because a lot of uh, 2D series animation is done with rig um, animation uh, uh, these days, like um, using Harmony or um, Moho, uh, Cell Action, things like that. Um, they, they tend even to be a different type of animator and animators that you, that's used to uh, working with a rig versus a, an animator who's used to um, creating every drawing, you know, uh, uh, 12 drawings per second. So um, they both have challenges. Um, uh, but you know there 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 is there um there is a lovely medium with a series, but it's a it's more work again. It's a lot of work. Um, Tom had talked about various influences um, when he was when you guys were working on uh, the Secret of Kells. Uh, I'm just curious, like, what are just in general? Do you have favorite films, animated or, or otherwise, that you look to for inspiration or just for pleasure? I do. I look at the Prince and the Head of Dragon fairly frequently because I just think it's a wonderful um, film where you get the sense of kind of an epic journey of a god, <laughs> you know, a, a child god. And then you have the real kind of childlike and childish kind of um, narrative and, and um, set of kind of character traits going on in one. I love films where it kind of hits that particular um, sensibility where you have something huge and epic that makes it like the question that we're all asking like why are we here or what do we do or how do we manage our journey and then you have something really specific like a tantrum or something you know um, it, 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 I, I, I love those and I, I keep kind of trying to circle around uh, just myself as a, as a as a storyteller or somebody who's in you know involved in other people's stories even in, in, in Cartoon Saloon those are the things that are that's the kind of exact kind of sweet spot I guess that interests me the most um gosh I saw a film recently at Virginia Film Festival called Smooth Talk which is a film that had been done and uh, made in the 80s and it starred uh, Laura Dern and even though it's really specific to the time it's about a young girl to kind of coming of age with big shaggy 80s perm and all this kind of <laughs> stuff and trying to navigate um, boys you know and that whole kind of side of life and trying to uh, kind of step out into the world as a young woman and all of the dangers that are there that it, it, it really struck me as an amazingly masterful piece of filmmaking because it it hit that even though it was really like of its time and ways and, mm. and that it hit it hit that exact thing it was it was a, a like a godlike odyssey <laughs> or you know it's just a really mythological you know or held big mythological kind of ideas while being you know contemporary to the to, to the to the the time period um so I do but and and across animation like Ghibli will always be you know a a massive massive influence and just to also because my I didn't get to grow up with the Ghibli films you know myself um I first became aware of them I'd say in college um and then uh but my children have grown up with them and I've so many you know fantastic and wonderful memories of um you know walking in our, our local woods with um (laughs) <laughs> with chalk in our pocket because there's a like a skateboard <laughs> and we could draw Totoro on, on the, <laughs> the, the the skateboard there. Um uh, I love the the sense of nature and wonder and the kind of childlike wonder that we all have in 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 a lot of the 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 Ghibli films. Um uh, and then live action as well. Uh, uh, you know really um David Lean's films I love mm-hmm. I love the sensibility the the cinematography the um the just the look and the, 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 of of those um and uh you know it, like every year there's 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 new films to you know Pinocchio this year um uh, the red turtle I absolutely adore that film I think it's absolutely <laughs> you know talking about 
minimal storytelling you know just getting across something extremely powerful uh, without dialogue you know <laughs> uh, for a feature you know duration that's really incredible so um yeah I do have it, it, my influences kind of shift depending on what I'm working on or what I'm trying to access I guess um so uh, it it uh, it can shift quite uh, quite a bit depending yeah depending on, on on kind of what I'm what I'm looking for or what I'm drawn to and then that kind of in itself kind of informs that the the, the next project you know and, and how what what the question is in that one yeah yeah uh, it's interesting you mentioned uh Studio Ghibli I hadn't I'd seen I think one of their films before and I but I didn't really get into it until my wife kind of reintroduced me to it and anything uh, because I'm the animation lover, anything that she's mildly interested in, I, I glom onto like, oh, let's watch it together. And so uh, the Studio Ghibli pictures really are, are beautiful. Last question uh, as our time winds down here. Uh, so so you, uh, you mentioned you raised uh, as children and Tom uh, uh, has also raised children. Um, and you also ended up getting sick, you know, while you were directing um, uh, The Breadwinner. Um, animation is this sort of demanding thing. It, it, it's, uh, in my mind, it's this sort of merciless, <laughs> uh, beast that, that would consume you if you let it, uh, and does from time to time, uh, awesome. all of us, I suppose. So how, um, particularly when you're doing independent animation, you're doing more than just animation. You're also building a studio and you're also building a, a brand and, and carving a niche. How do you go about doing that while maintaining a work-life balance so that, you know, um, if you do have a diagnosis while you're directing a film, um, you can continue to work on the film and also continue to get better. How do you, how do you guys strive to, to strike that balance? Um, we play it by year with me and we, we do have, we've an incredible, um, head of, um, human uh, resources in the, in the, in the company, Catherine Rycroft, who, really helps us all um uh, like across our our studio and then um uh, the, you know works with lighthouse uh, studios as well to try and navigate through it and to try and navigate through life we realized at one point that in cartoon saloon nobody had had any babies in nearly a decade and so we had to kind of we did a whole um uh thing about uh you know just like what you were entitled to if you wanted to have a baby um you know we talked to you know myself and other people who like you know who just talked about their experience of having children um about not waiting for the right time uh it was funny when I had my um my first child I thought you know okay well that's will be when the company is stable and when you know I've got this amount I've got a deposit for a house in the bank and all this kind of stuff <laughs> and of course I was ended up being what six or seven months pregnant while taking out like a huge car loan in order to like, pump some money into the company because we were you know we were at, at such a, a volatile time and so not only you know, was I not more stable than usual in terms of my finances and resources and that I was actually way less stable than normal but they're fine I you know, managed to feed <laughs> feed my kids they're okay <laughs> um, but you know you can always be waiting for the right time and even in like from a prof professional perspective people say well, you know, I'd really like to move to another department or do another thing, but I'm just going to wait to the right time. Mm -hmm. And there is no no right time. Um, things go wrong, but there's never a right time for for uh, for anything. Um, and the other thing is, I think it was uh, um, uh, Orion Ross from Disney once said to me that, you know, creatives are different during different decades of their life, you know, in that you can be in your 20s, you can be like, you know, the hottest things and sliced bread, you're amazing. Everybody's going, oh my God, that person is so wonderful. And wow, where they find the time they've done a short and they've done, you know, they've developed this feature and it's an amazing, and look at their sketchbook and everything. And uh, the next couple of years is, can be really tough for them or they might get a bit resentful, you know, because of the position that they're in or something that's going on for them or whatever. And, you know, you meet that person <laughs> maybe twice in a decade. You go, oh my God, are you even the same person? Mm -hmm. We're all different at different decades of our lives. Different things interest us. We have different levels of energy for different things. Um, and so I, I, we just tried, there's no easy answer to that that question. When I, I was, I remember getting the cancer diagnosis uh, during the breadwinner and going home that evening. I hadn't told anybody yet, not even my my. Um, my husband and opening the schedule and saying, okay, well, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, <laughs> this much <laughs> through rough animation. So I think I can kind of hobble along kind of thing with, because amazing people working on the project with me. 
but it was almost a bit of madness. Like I'd gone into such a weird place where I started looking at the schedule because the schedule was some kind of sanity in the chaos of life just exploding around me. And so I felt, well, that's look at that green box and that schedule. That's stuff that we've done. And this is stuff that we've yet to do. And I think if I can get to that next green box, you know, it'll be it'll be fine. And so like that's kind of how I managed the project. Uh, and it was always the case. I mean, I had the trust of, you know, Jerry Sharon and, and Paul Young and, and Tom Moore and, you know, catch it. Uh, uh, in 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 our in our uh, in our company, but there's so many people who just were okay with me just seeing what was going to happen and see how it was going to go. Um, uh, but uh, and that's kind of how I I kind of used work as um, a distraction, something that made sense. I could look at a, a scene of animation with uh, Fabian and with, uh, Giovanna and our, our team, and and we could fix something that wasn't wrong, or we could talk to the animator or something. Um, and then that was fine, you know, <laughs> and and so that made some kind of sense. And so you always look for some kind of anchors in your life to hold on to. Sometimes that's other people. Sometimes it's a it's a project. Sometimes it's you know letting go of things that you thought you know that that, that were important and and uh, finding finding something else. It's all you know. It's all a, a journey. If you if you're able to kind of have some kind of sense of um, awareness around it. And, you know, I would extend that to being aware enough to oh, hearing other people, you know, uh, when you, when you're when you're in the middle of a project. And again, all of these projects are so huge that you really do need other people and you need other people to be brave sometimes and tell you what's not working for you, <laughs> you know, and be, to be able to listen to that's when you know you're pretty healthy is when you're able to listen to other people, not in a way like them telling you what you should be doing, but in a way where they're they're kind of looking out for you. Um, yeah. So that's. That's a no answer to that question, but I don't think there is an answer. We're all striving for work-life balance. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if we'll ever get there. Yeah. No, I think I think that's uh I think that's helpful. I think it's encouraging. Uh, it's a little bit um uh, I think uh, kind of summed up in what you said, play it by ear. You know, it reminds me of a quote. I can't remember who said it, but they said, um, life is what happens when you're making plans. And uh I find that encouraging. Yeah, that was um it, yeah, and I remember there are times too where Tom will come and look at what I'm doing and I say, Oh, I'm so busy. Like I've got to finish, you know, this part of the edit because, you know, we have to have a look at it on Monday. And Tom will say, Yeah, but do you need to be doing that? Do you not have other people, you know, people who can work with you? And all this. So sometimes we're busy fools, you know, we can't, we grab onto some part rather than take a breath, maybe take the afternoon off, come back and say, Okay, how can we redistribute this in a way that makes use of everybody's uh, talents here and, and skills? Uh, there are times, of course, as a director where you do need to, you know, go away into a cave and, and um, you know, find exactly what the voice of the, the project is that you're working on. But there are other times where you, you know, and a lot of times, most of the times your directing job is to direct, not to do it all yourself. <laughs> oh, amazing. Amazing. Um, well, I promised a half hour. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this has meant a lot to me. Um, and I've really enjoyed and appreciate this conversation, uh, and I am encouraged and inspired. So, uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Wes.